there. Welcome to the Growth Whispers podcast, where everything we talk about is about helping leaders and their teams build enduring, great companies. Awesome companies, the kinds of companies that we want to read about for decades, kinds of companies we like to work at, kinds of companies that we actually like to do business with, kinds of companies that really make a positive impression on the planet and create opportunities for those around them and great returns for their shareholders. So I'm Kevin Lawrence and I'm joined today by my co-host, Brad Giles. Brad, how are you doing today? Very, very good. Thank you. Good and very interested to talk about our subject today. As always, we've got a word or phrase of the day. Kevin? Yes. What is your word or phrase? Well, actually, today? I'd like to let you go first today, Brad. I haven't had a chance to think about it, but I, I'd like oh. you to go first. Okay. Uh, my word today is spiral. Okay. So spiral. spiral. Yeah. So I do a newsletter each week and um, I, we were talking about this before the show. It's something that's been on my mind. So when we think about the work that we do, which is regular rhythmic meetings with uh, leadership teams it may look to other people uh that we're just going around in circles wherever we meet every quarter we meet every year and it's like yeah you know like they just come in and they do the same things and if you look at it only from one angle yeah it looks like you're going around in circles but if you look at it from another angle and if you think about a spiral that's going around in circles but each time it's going up higher and higher and higher uh, it's actually a different perspective because that's what we really see is organizations going higher and higher. Yeah. Up in a spiral, up, 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 up higher. So yeah, my word, that's what's on my mind. I wrote about it this week and I'm really been thinking, I have really been thinking about spiral. So tell me. Yeah. And I like that spiral. And I mentioned to you, you know, I was considered writing a book, um, around that same concept because I believe in it. Cause it's not only you have more perspective, in terms of being at a higher level, you have more insight because you have greater understanding and intelligence about whatever it is that you're doing. It's a super powerful concept. And that way it's not Groundhog Day where it looks the same. And by the way, if you're dealing with the same problems all the time, that means you're probably not building momentum, which is something we'll be talking about today. So my, my word today, I'm going to riff off what you're saying, is spy. Spy <laughs> as in espionage. Espionage, sorry. And... You know, I was watching this interesting documentary series just for a little bit uh, on the weekend um, about uh, spies and how they get information on governments in particular. But we also know some of this stuff happens in companies. So not advocating, you know, illegal information gathering. But there, what's, what's amazing out there is, is the amount that people will gladly share with you. And I remember... Um, an executive from a soft drink company that will remain unnamed that I met in an airport lounge after he'd had uh, a good half dozen cocktails. And, uh, and so I joined him, you know, he was probably going on to seven. I was on one and I'm curious and, and holy, did he tell me stuff and this massive global beverage company he told me what it was like in the boardroom because he was in one of those positions to put him in a boardroom. Wow. And, um, and let's just say, imagine two massive polar bears fighting, polar bears fighting, trying to kill each other. Um, that's what it was like in the boardroom of this company and the stories that he was telling me. Just, anyway, so the point is, is, is it's spy. And that is, where can you legally gather intelligence about the companies that you compete about against or the markets that you're in. And most people underutilize it. And it's as simple sometimes as calling up a CEO of a competitor and talking to them and having a, a willingness to, you know, get to know them, get to know you. And, you know, believe it, a lot of, a lot of competitors do collaborate on some ways, right? Sometimes they have, you know, backup supply for each other. Anyways, so it's spy. How can you get additional information or have relationships um, that are transparent but beneficial, and by nature you just learn a lot more. And uh, so yeah, so you're you're swir spiraling up, and I'm up there trying to zoom in, almost like with a satellite image, and get more information from that at greater height. 
Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So, so today with our, our theme of spiral and spies, you know, what is it that, that we're going to dig in today that we are excited about? By the way, you know, for those of you listening, we, we've been talking about doing this episode for about four or five, six months, you know, and for a number yeah. of reasons, today is the day. It's actually episode 50. So I think at our 50th episode, is that right? Today's 50th. It is yes. our 50th. Yeah. Yeah. It's our 50th episode. And hey, for something that we had talked about trying for six or 12 episodes, right? Back in, back in COVID there. Uh, yeah. It's kind of cool that we're 15, you know, two more episodes. It's going to be the, be, be the one year of doing it. So, you know, for episode 50, we're talking about something that we're, we're quite excited about and is incredibly impactful for the firms that we have the great honor to work with. So Brad, without further ado, a little drum roll. What are we talking about today? Today, we are talking about the flywheel, but let's be fair. You already know that if you're a listener, because you saw it uh, on the... Uh, on the subject of today. So we're talking about the flywheel. Flywheels are so important once you've built one. Once you've built one and you've watched it really embed in an organisation, a flywheel can be really, really important to clearly and simply and succinctly explain how do we get momentum within this business. So let's maybe begin with explaining what is it. And I'm going to refer to some text uh, where Jim Collins explains it. Obviously, it comes and from Jim his. Collins. Yeah, this comes from him. This is Jim's. And let's be very clear. We are giving full credit to Jim Collins, who created this concept, did the research that discovered it, and shared it with us. We're going to, you know, we're going to share our insights of how to apply it and leverage it with companies. But this is Jim's find, his invention. Okay, so let's let's step in. The flywheel effect is a concept developed in the book Good to Great. No matter how dramatic the end result, good to great transformations never happen in one fell swoop. In building a great company or social sector enterprise, there is no single defining action, no grand program, no killer innovation, no solitary lucky break, no miracle moment. Rather, the process resembles relentlessly pushing a giant, heavy flywheel, turn upon turn, building momentum until a point of breakthrough and beyond. So that's Jim's definition of the flywheel effect. And then, so the flywheel is a series of uh, actions that a business takes to create momentum. Yeah, and, and what I would say, and it's in this book, for those of you who see the video, it's from, he wrote a separate monograph on this called Turning the Flywheel just on this piece. I've got a wonderful signed copy here, which he was nice enough to sign. Um, uh, but you know, in simple terms, I'd put it is it's, you know, it's how do you build unstoppable momentum in your company? That's the idea. And a lot of companies don't. A lot of companies are a constant grind forever, and there's always stuff to do. But then there's others that spiral up and scale and they build more power and more momentum as they grow. And that's what this is about. So it's about, it's about making sure that choices that you make continue to build your momentum, but you got to know what builds momentum, first of all. And I'll share an example, like in our own firm, Brad, we didn't talk about this specifically, but we worked on the flywheel a couple of years ago and then really nailed it um, probably just over a year ago with some stuff we did with our team. And then we started paying more attention to it. And, and things have spooled dramatically since that. We just refocused a few things that we were doing because you know, we get caught up in being so passionate about what we're doing and excited about it. But sometimes we, for, you know, we get obsessed with doing great work for our clients, but that alone isn't enough. There's other things and it, it kind of brings and, and sews the strategy together. And that's really the idea of it is it guides everything. And I know here is it guides strategic focus on the highest value activities and ensures you build self-sustaining momentum over time. That's the idea. So if you've got a business and it's going well, but you can't feel the engine of it getting better and self-sustaining over time, you probably want to take a look at it. 
And self-sustaining is really a key thing to think about when you think about the momentum. So the, the, the business is growing, I'm going to say on its own, but, but you're making the, those key activities work, but that creates self-sustaining growth. It continues to spin faster and faster. So um, the great leaders take it from one turn to 10 turns, to a thousand turns, to a million turns, and it continues to spin faster and faster. Now, the only way that you can do that is with focus and discipline and understanding mm. these components and not trying to build many different businesses. Um, yes, and making it simple. And, and, and it's fascinating. Um, you know, if I, if I look at, you know, clients that we've implemented this in, you know, they're sure we've had many, many CEOs go and spend two days with Jim in his lab in Boulder. And this is one thing he talked about, you know, with intensity and passion uh, a lot. And every single client came out with this as a homework piece. And we've since implemented it probably over five years in lots of companies. And, you know, what's interesting, one of them that we did it in, we were, I remember we were sitting in a meeting down in Los Angeles beautiful day we're up on a, a rooftop deck and it was a spectacular as, as good as a day in LA can get um, close to the beach it was all it was awesome but we're going through and identifying the fly because the company got in trouble and they brought me in when the company got in trouble and so we're sitting there and we're going through the flywheel we figured out their flywheel hmm. and then we went and rated how strong each of the areas were and the look that the CEO had was almost horrified. And I could feel the feeling in their body and it was gut-wrenching because the second or third thing on the flywheel was they rated it at a three out of 10. Yeah. Then they went through and looked at where they had spent money in the last two or three years. And it was like a one out of 10. They looked at where they had hired people on the flywheel proportionally. It was like a zero out of 10. Because they, they, they actually, in the excitement of their success, forgot a key aspect of their success. And they knew it. They could, they could rattle it off. But they had forgot it. And when we went through and did the flywheel, it was like... <sighs> We need to invest more. We need to change more. We need to bring this back to life. We need to get the right person running this who is going to yeah. fight for the piece of the flywheel. So the point of it is I've had many clients that when we go through and do the exercise, first of all, they're like, whoa. Yeah. Um, th there's something that they make a, a notable recalibration on. And that piece that is notably weak on the flywheel they can see how it, the direct correlation, how it's holding them back. So it's a, it's a health check and a reality check on your spooling of your strategy to make your business, you know, spiral up. It's, it's, it's insanely powerful and it's not the easiest thing to figure out. So what we're going to do today is give you some guidelines to help you to figure it out so that you can get the benefit of having it and then making it part of your reality check that you do every quarter and every year. Yeah. Um, and so I guess before we jump in further, we've, we've explained what a hedgehog concept is, but I'd like to also just explain uh, what, sorry, what a flywheel is. I'd like to also explain what a hedgehog is and what a smack recipe is, because we're going to yes. talk about those things a little bit later on. So let's begin with a hedgehog concept is a simple crystalline concept that flows from the deep understanding about the intersection. Think about three circles intersecting in the center of Venn diagram, the intersection of purpose or core purpose, um, what a company can be best at and a company's profit per X or single economic denominator. Then that, so that's the hedgehog concept, okay? We've spoken about that before on this podcast. Now a smack recipe, that's the code for translating. And, and before you oh, yeah. finish, the, the hedgehog is just a simple way to articulate what your business is about. And, you yeah. know, what's, you know, best in the world, uh, passionate about, and what makes your money. Those three things, the center of which sits your BHAG, your big, hairy, audacious goal that you want to achieve over the next 10 or 30 years. So that that is a core central basic piece and understanding of it's kind of like, you know, who we are and what are we about? 
in, in simple terms. So that's the hedgehog. And then we move on yeah. to what we call the smack recipe. So that's short for specific, methodical, and consistent. So this is again about discipline. So a smack recipe is the code for translating a high level hedgehog concept into specific action and for keeping an organization focused in the same direction, thereby building flywheel momentum. So again, it's about keeping the organization focused in the same direction. So the more that we can not get distracted, the more yes. that we can maintain focus in the right direction, understanding the components that make up the flywheel, the more that we can build that flywheel momentum. Yeah, and that's at the root of most strategies is to stay focused on the most highly impactful activities. And as companies grow, they get diluted by interesting creative ideas and basically dilute their force. And it's no different than if you have um, uh, a bullet you want to shoot at a target or an arrow you want to shoot at a target. When you shoot it, if it splits off into a hundred pieces, it's not going to have the same impact versus yeah. one single projectile hitting a target is going to have more impact versus it kind of spraying. And it's, we want to keep the impact behind our actions. That is the idea. And again, these are things to help us. So with a hedgehog in mind, and I even, you know, when we do it with clients, we even put the hedgehog in the middle and the flywheel around it. Right. And, you know, as we're talking about the smack, there's probably a visual way to integrate the smack. Uh, as as part of it to help stay focused. So, and yeah, I think that's that's a. Go ahead, so Brad. here's the crazy, crazy thing, right? You already, if you're listening to this, you already have a flywheel. Yeah, it's it already might just there. Suck. It just might be a bad one. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you already have a great idea, but it might be buried in the back of your brain, mixed in with the bad ideas. But, but yeah. there, is, there is brilliant ideas in all of our brains, but sometimes they get lost. Yeah. And the thing is, is that we are not making a flywheel. Okay. We are discovering a flywheel. And it's such yes. a different, it's, it's such a different way to think about it. It's already Unless there. you're a startup and you're trying, you don't even know which way is up yet and what your business model is. But, but with this, you know, most of the companies aren't, aren't pure startups. But if you've been around and already had some good success, there is a version of a flywheel. Now it might be a weak flywheel or it might have weakened or it might be awesome, but it's discovery to get clarity so that you can use decisions that constantly enhance it. So yeah, you already got one. It just, it might be a positive one. It might be neutral and it might be a negative flywheel, which Collins calls the doom loop in his work. Yeah, so let's go back to the spiral you can have spirals which are going upwards, which is not the best analogy, uh, but spirals that are going upwards and creating more momentum, or you can have ones that are going down and then they're the doom loop. So you can have positive or negative flywheels. Um, the, thing, the thing with it is that it's already there. Every business already has a flywheel, but most of the time, they're not focused on it and they're not, they're, they're distracted and the absence of discipline around the flywheel means that they're, they're not seeing anywhere near the kind of effort that they could. Right. So in one of the companies that, that we work with, um, uh, the CEO came out of Jim's session. He figures when he sold the company, it added 20%, not more than 20% to the value of the organization because we could articulate the flywheel. And he yep. sold it for a big number. So that was a big value. Like he, yeah, yeah. Uh, we won't need to get into specifics there. But, but the interesting thing is, is that everything that we did, if it didn't line up to the flywheel, we didn't do it. All of yep. our acquisition targets had to enhance the flywheel. And, if, and me, even if they didn't fit within the flywheel, we wouldn't do them. There was one that slipped through that was a bad choice, but acquisition targets, everything went back to the flywheel, flywheel. Interestingly, when that CEO would address the company as he did on a fairly regular basis in the leaders, what he talked about was aside from the, the, the culture, 
you know, the purpose and the values was a flywheel and the hedgehog again and again and again. It, it was, it, for him, it was the most important thing because if we improve this thing, the whole machine improves. And I, you know what? I reckon yeah. that everybody in that organization would have understood the flywheel and they would have understood. Oh my gosh, that was so simple. It was but so simple. That's the thing. Strategy, everyone tries to make strategy more complex than it should be. Okay? Because they don't but know what they're doing. If your strategy is complicated, it means you don't understand it. It should be able to make sense to a 10-year-old kid. The best strategies are so basic, except for the ones that are complicated, but those usually aren't the best ones. Yeah. Now, and it's not that a, a mad, brilliant, crazy, spectacular scientist couldn't come up with potentially a better strategy. But if it's super complicated and intricate, even though it could be better, it's yeah. almost impossible to execute. Yeah. So a simplified version and, and simplifying, you know, simply is, you know, my generally mastery my, as you know, my, one of my favorite quotes is attributed to Mark Twain may or may not have actually been him, but uh, we'll go with Mark Twain today. And it's, you know, I would have written you a shorter letter, but I didn't have the time, right? It's hard to be simple and succinct and simply is simplicity is mastery. Yeah. But, but, you know, you can't scale something that isn't insanely simple and easy to understand. It doesn't scale. Yeah. And so for that leader in that example, many times, I'm going to say every time, many times when he's communicating to the staff, yep. what he's doing is reinforcing what's most important because people respect what you inspect, right? So if the most important thing is, right, this is our hedgehog, and this is our flywheel, and this is how they work together. It's everyone gets it. Everyone knows what the most important things are. Yes. Um, as long as you keep reminding them. Yeah, <laughs> of course. The, but that's the job of, or part of one of the key jobs of the leader is to keep reminding yes. them. So yes. I want to give a, a quick example of a flywheel, which is Amazon. Okay. Amazon has a really simple flywheel that most people would get because most people know Amazon. So it's got five components. Number one is lower prices on more offerings. Number two, if we do that, have lower prices on more offerings, we can't help but have increase customer visits. More people will come because we've got lower offerings. If we increase customer visits, we can't help but attract third party sellers. So there's more people on our platform more third parties are, are going to want to come and sell. So already in these first three steps, you can see the momentum that this builds. Then we, then we move to number four. We expand the store and extend the distribution. Now, if we attract those third party sellers, the previous point, we can't help but expand the store and extend distribution. If we do that, we can't help but grow our revenues per fixed costs. So we've got more revenues per fixed costs. And if we do that, we can't help but lower prices on more offerings. So you can see as we go around that circle, how it builds momentum in the business and how Amazon's grown to be, if not the largest, depending on when you listen to this, one of the largest companies in the world, just by focusing on that really, really simple model. It is. And, you know, and Jim had done some work with, um, I think it was with Bezos when he talked about this. He did uh, back in pulling... 2000, I think it was. Yes, that was when they talked. Here, and here is, I'll put the image on the screen out of Jim's book, Turning the Flywheel. For those, can I find it? There's, a, there's, a, there's an image on page two of his book. But the idea is one thing feeds the next thing. And before you know it, because it because they have they've lowered the costs and then they can have um, I'll go back to the flywheel here it becomes an uncontrollable force so because because they can lower their prices they can get more customers which gets more people wants to sell to them which gets a better store which grows revenue per fixed cost lower the price lower price brings more customers more customers brings more sellers who put more stuff on the site more revenue per fixed cost lower the prices. And then it just keeps going and going and going and to the point where, you know, there's this thing called monopoly 
which you know people don't like, where they almost companies pretty well control the market. So the idea with the flywheel, in reality, what you're wanting to do is to push the limits to be such a powerful force um, that that it almost, in other people's eyes, is unfair. The truth is, you've just got such momentum because you've been so darn good. So lots of that's a great that's a great example. We have another client that has one, and I'll keep it generic, but it's basically as their flywheel goals, they keep getting to hire more amazing people who innovate, which the customers are thrilled. The customers ref- stay obviously, but refer other people. And because they have a larger customer base, they get way better buying power. So for them, it's leveraging suppliers and, 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 and buying, buying power, getting discounts because yeah. of the buying power, they can invest more in people, which make the products and services better, which thrill the customers, which gets more referrals, which gets them a bigger client base, which gets more buying power. And then yeah. it just, to the point in this company, um, they were number one in their space in the state they were in, in the U S um, and it was a very uh, state-based business. It was a substantial company. Uh, they bought number two and number two was almost relieved. Like, mm-hmm. like, th- and we talked, I, we talked to some of the people in the acquiring company. They're like, thank God. Like we were done because they were such a powerful force. Yeah. Now we bought that company and we know we could have crushed them, but we bought it because we wanted to take the customers and we didn't want to fully destroy the company. It was good value to buy them and take over those customers. But it was a machine. And interestingly, their flywheel was so strong, but their product differentiation actually wasn't that strong. So when you would line their product up, and we did some work on that, it's another conversation, but, but their flywheel was so strong, it, it almost didn't matter. They were mm-hmm. just a beast. And interestingly, they got to 91% A players in their company. And there was hundreds of people. It wow. was just a beast, like a beast of a machine. It was, it was an army. It was unbelievable. So lots of, lots of great things. And we can also yeah. talk about when it doesn't work. Go ahead, Brad. Um, yeah, so their product differentiation may not have been different or possible, but they mm-hmm. were differentiating through their flywheel in, in terms of uh, they were getting the simple things right consistently yes. all the time service excellence yeah their, their differentiation was better service but product wise there wasn't but but their flywheel all was around service excellence yeah like just the best service you could possibly get in that industry anyway it's just awesome examples and then there's been the ones that go the other way you know and we tend not to work with companies like that but companies you work with might go through phases where and you know in, in the in, when you when you don't have this or you have a negative flywheel, you know in Colin's maps and so, but the essence of it is you do something, it fails. Yeah. Your people get disengaged or disappointed, then you just try anything, and usually it's hype and 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 you're throwing spaghetti at the wall, it fails. Your people are disappointed, and you you just flail and do something else. And the, the typical is. You come up with some big slogan or, you know, a fancy outside CEO and and you're not strategic and you're not disciplined. You're just chucking stuff at the wall and hoping stuff works. And you have good intentions versus getting back and grinding out as, as Colin says, one of his favorite quotes from, from the session I did with him was, you know, success is relentless execution of the boring basics that are within your hedgehog. The basics, yeah. like went to a restaurant last uh, on the weekend and I ordered, uh, you know, uh, a couple things and, and the people there are really nice, but, you know, asked for water and they forgot to bring water for probably 20 minutes. The basic, you know, it's not rock science. And I asked for my meal to be cooked a certain way uh-huh. and it wasn't, and it was not a crazy request. It was a normal request. So, you know, would I go back? Yeah, because I like the place and it's close. The people are nice. But, you know, the, 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 the basics of bring water when a customer wants water. And maybe it was a bad night or a bad, who, a bad hour. Who knows? And cooking something as it's expected. But if they do that two or three times, you know, they're not going to have a lineup for reservations. 
right? It's it's and they're it's, not going to the build basic. momentum. They're not going to build momentum. No. That's the thing. Exactly. Would you, you recommend that to other people? Would you be a raving fan and an advocate? Would you go back? No, because they're no, not. No, I would give them not. another try. But the other try, the previous experience was awesome. But another try. And that's why I don't want to say their name. Super nice people there. But 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 I'll give them another try. But then after that, I'll probably start going. I, I'd go somewhere different. Yeah, because it's. I went to basics. a restaurant on the weekend as well. It was on the beach, like so. Where I live, we have uh, sunset over the water. Um, so you go mm. to a restaurant on the beach, you look at the sun go down for dinner. It's lovely. So that was fantastic. Like the fit out was lovely. The staff were pretty friendly, but the food was just okay. Like it wasn't even okay. It was just a oh, ho hum, right? So it's the, the what is how do you build momentum in that type of environment? Yeah, you have the sunsets. Yeah, you have good staff. And yeah, you have food. It doesn't need to be like the best food in the world. It just needs to be, yeah, it was pretty good. Like it's, it, and, and that's the relentless focus on the boring yes. basics and that applies to every business. And it's consistently good or pretty good. Yeah, and again, it's not rocket science. So basically take a restaurant that's underperforming. People would, you know, change a menu, right? Or change a name or repaint a wall or got a bunch of staff out maybe it works but at the end of the day what does a customer want they want what they've asked for they want good pleasant service which this place has the service piece covered it's not rocket science but that, that people get lost in all of this other stuff and it's from the eyes of the customer what are the basics that matter the most and that's and the flywheel should point you in that direction something that, that helps you to be thinking that way. Go ahead. So there's there's two there's two problems that um, create this issue that creates the need for a hedgehog smack and a flywheel. Okay, and those are number one is the human brain doesn't like discipline. The human brain gets yep. bored and it wants to be creative. It yep. really wants to do new and exciting things. To yeah. to focus on the boring basics, the human brain is like, that is not what I want to do at all. But the second thing is that leaders are seduced by an endless search for the next big thing. And, and, and many leaders want to pursue growth for growth's sake. Yeah, and that's okay as long as somebody else is focusing on those boring basics to make sure they're right, and your strategy is pointed at speeding up your flywheel. It, it new can be good, but often it's more dangerous than it is good for for a lot of people. Well, it's so, not growth for growth's sake. I I often no, say to people, it's growth to become a better organization and better take care of your customers or your employees. Yeah, but quality growth, not just growth. Because otherwise, you fall on your face. Yeah. So, and so how, you go. Yeah, I was just gonna say, look. So, how do you do it? You know, and you know, we talked about starting with a hedgehog and you know, and a smack list, but you just go through and try and unpack. And sometimes you have to go back five years in the business. What is it that drives this thing? What is it? And you know, and. It's as simple as a brainstorm of trying to map out pieces. We like to get people sit on your own and think about it. Then let's work on it as a group. What is it that drives this business? And the question is, you know, um, what is the language that Jim uses? Uh, because of which we but. can't help but. Can't help but. Yeah. So, for example, this other company we talked about. Because we provide outstanding service experience to our customer, we can't help but retain them and get referrals. Because we retain them and, 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 and get referrals, we can't help but grow the total number of users in our system. Because we have a, a, a massive increase on our total number of users, we can't help but leverage that for better buying power with our suppliers. Because we, we have better buying power and save that money, we can't help but but be able to invest in more amazing people, because it, so it's we can't help but and really one thing really specifically driving the next. Now it's it, it, like we can't give you a paint by number. It's a it's a discussion. Sometimes you do one, you throw it away, you try again, you try from three or four different perspectives. 
you know, sometimes there's one that's a customer oriented flywheel. Sometimes it's a product or R and D flywheel, like, uh, like Intel's example. Um, sometimes it's an employee oriented flywheel and I'm sure there's many different types, but it's, it's to start mapping it out. And because, and then by the time you end up with four or five, six things that really drive in, into a continuous loop, like a flywheel that spins spools up. But it's already there. It's already inside yes. your business and the insights come from the hedgehog and the smack recipe. And those things are built using very specific methods that yes. will give you a great and deep insight. You can't just you can't just rock up and go, hey, let's get some stuff onto a page and then that'll mean we'll become Amazon. It just doesn't work that way. You, you've got to do the thinking. There has a, there's been work. historically. Now, and again, those things may not be working at the time. Sometimes they fall, they fail. Yeah. But historically, this has led to this. So for example, one of the companies had made an expansion into the US and it was going horribly well for a number of reasons. And, but Canada was a wild success story. So we just went back into Canada. We went, we just didn't even bother looking at the US. We went five years back in Canada. Okay, what were you doing when the growth engine took off and what was it? What, what were the specific things? And we went through and we made the flywheel. And then we overlaid it to the US and we're like, oh, no wonder. That's, that's why it's completely logical. It is so obvious, but you're right, Brett. You got to go back in time uh, to map it out. So you go and map it out, but you know, let's move on. So that's point two. How do you create it? Starting with the, the hedgehog and the smack list as content, go through and map it out. And then never go ahead, Brad. You got something you want to add there? And so how many fly, this is a great mistake that I've seen. How many flywheels should an organization have? six, eight, 14. How many would you like to have? I mean, you know, it doesn't really, you know, you don't, it doesn't, you know, you don't need to have one. You could, you know, you don't need to be disciplined. You could just have a whole bunch because they're kind of fun to play with. You know, just heck, you know, you could also have 27 goals uh, per person per quarter. I mean, why wouldn't you have more of the better, more of the merrier? That's a better party having 27 instead of seven, isn't it? Yeah, and that's cool because then we'll get more stuff done if we have 27 goals. Totally, so, we get 27 times the thing done. If we have 27 goals and 14 flywheels and we you know, we should have like at least a dozen core values. And while we're at it, we should probably have seven different names for the company. That's, you know. So for those of you who may not have picked up, there's a an... an uh, a blanket of sarcasm that's just fallen over us. Let's remove that and come back and shake that blanket off. Uh, no, what we're saying is you should have one flywheel for each CEO. One flywheel for each CEO. And, and why is that? Because you may have multiple profit and loss and balance sheets in an organization Okay, but you're probably only going to have one CEO. And so I think about one organization that I work with, and they've got two distinct divisions that work with different types of customers. Okay, one's more of a, more of a, let's say, a smaller customer, the other one's a much larger customer. But we've got a central flywheel that works across the, the entire CEO's oversight. Then there's another business and they, yeah, they have got three different, um, three different areas in which they operate. They're all in the same industry, but three completely different areas, one CEO and all of those, they have the same flywheel. So, because sometimes the energy of the CEO, you want it all to be going in the same way, as you mentioned earlier with your friend, who your friend, your colleague, your associate, who um, comes out, talks about the flywheel and the hedgehog relentlessly. Yep. Um, one central point of focus per CEO. I think so. And that can be hard. Anybody can come up with seven or three, but to get down to the one flywheel that drives the whole machine, all of the assets that you have in an organization's curriculum. Now, teams might 
go and develop a flywheel, a little sub flywheel, let's call it. But that's not the part that we're obsessed with. We're obsessed with the main one for the organization that drives the organizational strategy. You could have your logistics team that might think about it down in logistics. You know, in some organizations, you know, in a, a divisional level, they will allow them to create a divisional purpose or a divisional behag or a divisional whatever. That's, we're not saying you can't, you, you might let people do it, but this is about the over, or, overall organization and the one that we all talk about regularly, just like the one company name and the one behag and the one set of core values. I think it's super important and companies sometimes that aren't good at simplicity will create multiples. So I think it's, it's super important. I agree. So, so, so one per CEO, and then how do you know that it's correct? Right. And, and, you know, it's, it's not rocket science, but you know, Brad, you and I are big on pressure testing ideas and because theory, theory doesn't produce value. It's, it's reality that produces value. So, the one that the simple pressure test is going through and saying, does this directly drive this? Or because of this, is it true that we can't help but get the next one? Um, the second is to go through and look at some of your biggest periods of success or divisions or parts of your business that have had massive success or massive failure and go and then pressure test. So was there something in here that was actually critical to our success when we did well and was there something in this that broke that that was a that was critical to our failure that's another that's another way of pressure testing it to make sure that you absolutely got it yeah does it explain your failures and successes or your successes and disappointments that's the that's the simplest test when you look through those three to six uh, items can you say yeah well when we uh launched in this market or when we did that or when we did that like that absolutely succeeded because of that or that absolutely failed because of that yeah so so that's the simplest way to validate it. it's correct there's no there's no enormous um diagnostic that you need to take just ask can yeah, we I explain agree. our successes and disappointments yep exactly now now that we've, so we've, we've gone through and we know what it is, we're pushing towards positive, we've drafted it, we've validated it's correct, we know we've only got one. How do you speed this thing up? And this seems basic, right? But, but it's like, what are the things that actually speed it up? And, and, you know, hold on to your hat. This is rocket science here, but it's, you literally make sure that your major goals relate to an area of the flywheel. Right now, if you've evaluated yourself and you have one area that's really low, like that client I talked to you about when we had the meeting in California, you better make darn sure you fix that because that will, every time the flywheel spins, that one area, it's going to slow down because it's a weak spot. So you got to make sure you patch up your weaknesses and, 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 you know, shore them up with the right resources and get them back to success. But, but ideally is that your most important, your, you know, your, your, your major goals you have for three years, we call them key thrusts or priorities or whatever you want to call them, um, uh, that they should directly be linking to the flywheel. And it's not that everything on your flywheel needs to be your three-year goals, but your three-year goals need to drive what matters and your one-year goals and your quarterly goals. That's a simple, simple thing to look at. And, and, and you know, if you can go and look at your plans, often, Brad, you know, for you and I both, when we go to a company and evaluate their strategy and their execution plans, often they're all over the road. Yeah. It all seems like important stuff, but if you put it through the filter of the flywheel, uh, it might not make a difference. And, and even though they have beautiful intentions and awesome plans. Because so, leaders are often seduced by an endless search for the next big thing. And they pursue yes. growth for the sake of growth. And that means that sometimes priorities land on these 90 day or one year or three year lists that may not necessarily make sense yeah and sometimes leaders are seduced by the good old things right there's yeah. some who are caught up in the shiny new there's all others that are caught up in the reliable old and that can be just as bad you know we go into companies and 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 their three-year strategy in our company hasn't changed a lot in a decade now that can be a good thing for some 
Sometimes they've just, they got stuck tunnel vision and thinking about their business and it needs a shake. So again, there is no right answer here. The key is that you got to invest into those things that speed it up and um, yeah, that, that speed it up. And, 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 you know, and the kind of, or point number five, and it's a bit of almost maybe not needed, but how do you make sure you don't slow it down? Well, don't invest in things that don't speed it up. Right. Yeah. That's, that's obvious. And I would add to that regularly look at it quarterly and annual yes. planning sessions. So what color, and this kind of will lead to our next point, but what color is this component of the flywheel currently? Is it red or green? And then what do we need to do to get it to become green? Yeah. So for example, uh, last week I spent all week uh, virtually with my, one of my, my clients in India. Right. I think I talked to them a little bit last week. They're, they're like, they're like family, you know, and I saw so six nights, six evenings in my time. And one of our things that we did with the, with the three directors that run the three brothers is we go through and evaluate the flywheel. Where are we at? How are we doing on the different pieces? You know, how do we take that into mind when we set the three-year strategy? You know, every, every court or, or every time I meet with them, uh, you know, we do a twice a year meeting. We go back and we get a report color coding the flywheel, not only overall, but, but by division, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So, yeah, which, so, so which really leads us, which really leads us into number six, the next one, which is how do you measure yes. it? And we both touched on that. I've got one client that comes to mind um, and we've taken the flywheel really, really deep into the layers of the org chart. And so we've divided each of the components of the flywheel into what are the four things that we do that makes this uh, component of the flywheel uh, work. Okay, so we've got to have salespeople having that KPI and we've got to have the operations people having that KPI yep. or whatever it might be. So across the flywheel, we can look at it in its simplicity, but then we can look behind it to the things that make uh, the KPIs that we need in each of the areas, the business to have that flywheel color green, let's right. say. And then beyond that, like you just mentioned, we're setting priorities uh, at a 90 day or a one year or a three year level to get those, um, those KPIs to green. Yeah, so I, I, exactly. So what, what I heard you say, Brad, is that, you know, that you have KPIs for each part of the flywheel and it, even looking at that way, you can delegate it down to make sure different departments are doing their part to enhance that piece. So yeah, I've got one client where they have one KPI for each part of the flywheel. I've got another that's got four. I don't really care how many you got, but you know, even the one has four, the combination of those four measures indicate it. And because of that, we can provide a score and coloring. And you and I both love red, yellow, and green coloring. Just, you know, traffic lights. Basic, we did a previous episode on that. Uh, of the podcast, but it's, it's a simple way to evaluate performance and, and, you know, and, and, and you know, which it's basic, but and what's the reporting and like you said, Brad, every quarter looking at it. Um, and, and we'll talk about it in our in number eight about how do you tweak it? So, so six is, you know, how do you measure it? KPIs and red, red, red yellow, green. And then number seven, which I started is, is how do you, how do you, how do you leverage it across multiple divisions or locations? So here, this simply, we've got one flywheel for the overall business. We take the identical flywheel without touching it. And we use it as an analysis tool on divisions or departments. So uh, the client in India, for example, they have, you know, just under 10 different locations that they work in throughout the country. So when we get the flywheel reports, we actually don't get summary data on the overall. We get the report on each different location, red, yellow, green, and where there's a yellow or a red, a comment of why and what can be done to fix it by the person who runs that location. So the, the people that run the locations, which are like you know general managers of divisions, they know themselves to evaluate themselves on the flywheel and they're being trained to come up with action plans. So, it's very simple. You just apply it as a filter to look at a piece of it. And, and the correlation in this company is insane. It feels like a direct correlation between the flywheel and performance. 
Now, not only anything, and there's not, not every, many things in the world are 100% direct, but there's an insanely strong correlation between, because they've got it right, between the, the colors on the flywheel. So the, the, the highest performing locations are generally green all around. So you know? I would go as far as to say, notwithstanding your last comment, I would go as far as to say, when the flywheel is all green, you're outperforming the market mm -hmm. in terms of growth. Yeah, um, yes, you should be outperforming the market or at least you're performing at your best, right? Like you are the doing, you are just, you, you are excellent. Like in most cases, you're probably outperforming the market. You should be, yes. I'm just, I'm, I'm filtering that as we're talking about it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I so did just pull is, that one out of thin air. Yeah, you know, I know that. You don't, you don't. You don't. <laughs> so, but it's, but it's basically, it's an evaluation tool. But the key to remember, this is not a corporate head office. Let me evaluate you. You're training people to think about their business to be better, smarter operators in everything we do. Again, with that spiraling up, with everything we do, every person that we're working, we're almost subconsciously wanting to train them to be the CEO or to move in that direction to be a better, more capable version of themselves. Um, so the number eight, you know, how do you optimize it over time? And we've already said this, but it's, you know, quarterly planning meetings, looking at it, evaluate it, take that into account when you reset your goals. Uh, annual planning, to go really look at it and say, would we change something? Like I'm a big believer in once you lock down any strategic principle, you shouldn't debate it throughout the year unless something's really gone wrong. Hmm. You should drop into execution mode, execute like crazy. And then when you decide it's time, then there's a period where you evaluate. And whether it's at a, a six month mark in the year where the, the executive goes off and works on strategy, which some clients do, or it's at the annual planning meeting, it doesn't matter when it is. But in those quarterly, you know, staying in execution mode and then evaluate strategically whenever you do it. And ask, have we had any failures in the last year or quarter, but year? And does is that explained by our flywheel? Because sometimes yes. not adhering to the flywheel means that you will experience a failure. But, yes. you know, like I go back to the spiral at the beginning of this episode. We're getting a deeper understanding over the years of our flywheel Deeper understanding, deeper understanding. And so that regular rhythm and checking in makes a huge, huge difference. Yep, I agree. And the thing I'd really want people to understand, Brad, is look, our role is to help facilitate companies that want to build enduring great companies and continue that growth path and get bigger and better continually. That's their, that's their, their goals and that's what we do. And we look at, there's lots of diff different tools out there. And I would look at what sticks and continues to add value two, three, five years in the future. And the flywheel absolutely does. Yes. Five years in the future, it's still insanely valuable and we will never stop looking at it. it, it it's, it's, it's incredible. And in companies that keep focusing on it, they generally keep getting better and better because they're obsessed with the stuff that matters most. So should we do a quick recap here, Brad? And maybe Let's... I'll do one, you can do the next. I'll start with number one and we'll go back and forth. So like a plan. number one point to remember is, you know, you've already got a flywheel and either it's a positive flywheel that's spiraling you up or you could have a doom loop that keeps knocking you down. And yeah, that's, that's the first thing to remember. It's already there. And our job is to discover it. Uh, number two is, is you begin by understanding your hedgehog concept and smack list. So you look at those two things. If you haven't got it, then you build those before you build the flywheel. You get a deep understanding of what works and what doesn't in those areas. That's the, you, you know, that's the qualifier, the preconceiver. Right. And those both are also principles you'll still look at five years down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, number three is you got to validate it's correct. First of all, make sure you only have one, one per CEO. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, but, but each piece should drive the next piece and you should be able to say, because of this, we can't help but as it drives to the next piece. Number four, how to speed it up. Well, a relentless execution of the boring basics within your hedgehog. 
So ask the question, what color is it? Which we'll get to in a moment. Ask the question, but then relentless, boring ex or execution of the boring basics. Yeah. Yes, and find people that like doing that stuff that we might consider boring. Uh, five, and it was kind of obvious, how do, you, how do you not slow it down? Well, don't do things that don't relate to the flywheel and distract energy away from it and evaluate on a quarterly basis how you're doing so you can keep tweaking it. Yeah, so, and then number six, how do you measure it and know that it's getting stronger? Red, yellow, green each of the components within the flywheel and then ask yourself what are the key performance indicators that will um, tell us that we're consistently going to be green measure those and then build priorities that will help to uh, give the business the ability to achieve those kpis number seven how do you leverage across multiple divisions and locations well you take the one flywheel, you don't make new ones, and use it as an analysis tool to evaluate and ideally train the people that run that part of the business to use it to guide their thinking and their actions. And then finally, number eight, how do you optimize it over time? Well, at annual planning sessions, rethink it. Ask yourself, uh, have we had any failures in the past year? And is that explained by our flywheel? Have we had any successes? Is that mm. explained? So help the leadership team to get a deeper understanding of what the flywheel is doing and not doing and, and kind of continually stress test it. What a good episode this has been. It um, was. So let's make sure turning the flywheel, the monograph by Jim Collins, go and read it. Go back to good to great. And by the way, if you happen to be in one of those doom loops, go back to what used to be my favorite of all Jim's books, How the Mighty Fall. This is about the doom loop, about companies that make bad choices and stay in a negative downward spiral, um, often until they either straighten themselves out with relentless execution of the boring basics uh, or they get bought. And, and quickly, that turning the flywheel book is about a one hour read. Like it's, a, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a monograph. It's like 38 pages, I think. Um, I think so, yeah, you're, you're such a precise brain. It's actually 37 and then notes. Yeah, so, yeah. so um, it's a very it's, easy it's, read. You can see it's very thin. You can, you can probably read it before your plane takes off if you're one of those people that's back to traveling. So I would really want to say a thank a shout out to Jim Collins and thank him for this great research. You know, we rely on that research a lot in this, and you know, and we're we're expert, experts at implementing it in companies and bringing the value to life, and and we're grateful to have people that have created these concepts that are proven based on research, not just hypothetical ideas. Awesome. So. <clears throat> Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode about the flywheel. Uh, this has been the Growth Whisperers, where we always talk about building enduring great companies. My name is Brad Giles, and you can find me at evolutionpartners.com.au. And of course, my co-host, Kevin, the Canadian with the extra cheese, who joins me every <laughs> week, uh, you can find him at lawrenceandco.com. Thanks very much for listening. We look forward to chatting again next week.